rising under the pember. I got it. Um, been organizing to help support the clean water in this town where I live and farm. And that is a project of Greenhorns, which is an organization I have led now for 15 years that is mostly focused on young farmers and not at all um, having any knowledge of mining until the miners came to this town. So um, we're on a learning curve. And if you want to learn more, I suggest you visit the PembrokeCleanWater.org website and the Friends of Cobscook Bay website where you can find a great set of learning resources. So without further ado, we ask you please to put yourselves on mute and um, feel free to put lots in the chat. And after um, I introduce Dwayne and he introduces John and he introduces Winona, she'll speak and then we have plenty of time for questions. Okay, so I'm so grateful to have um, met Dwayne because he pulled over on the side of the highway where we were painting our banner to say, protect our water. And he said, I wanna meet you guys. And we wanted to meet him. And we were very grateful that he challenged us to hold a community meeting. Um, and more people showed up who wanted to protect the water. And this, this call today is um, as a response to the call at that meeting for more information to be brought. Dwayne is the director of the Wabanaki Museum. He's a historian and curator um, and specialist in the Pasmaquoddy language and translator of um, the Pasmaquoddy wax cylinders. Is that enough introduction for you, Dwayne? Mute. Thank you, Willie Wynn. Thank you very much. First of all, it's an honor to be here this afternoon. And it's customary for our people to, um, to be thankful for all the wonderful things around us. So I just want to say a few words in our language and translate to you some Kchitpud Zamagwan. Kchitpud Zamagwan. Kchitpud Zamagwan is water is very sacred to all of us. Wuliwan Gichi ni Weskum, Milinen, Abtubem Kiskak, Bamausawagan. Naga Milinen, Milinen, Eduji, Wulinagwak, Ewego, Tig, Yud, Eluita Zig, Jeepnak Twimini. Would you come in a Gichi ni Weskum, Sida when Gazelman en, Naga to Wedgie, would you come on en? Make we do Haman Noguna. Elmini Kaniaula Didi Uliwen Gichini Westkumen. Thank you, Creator, for giving us another day of life and for giving us such a beautiful place to live here on Turtle Island. Help us, Creator, to love and help everyone. We also want to remember those that have gone before us. Thank you, Creator. To all our relatives and relations. As I um, first met um, Severin and, I, and she um, told you how we met, you know, I seen um, the energy off of those, the artwork that she was putting on there and trying to share how important water was. And it caught my attention because it's so important, because water is sacred to our people. So I just want to thank you very much, Severin, for having that opportunity and for us to be having this opportunity to be able to talk about water and how important water is to us and how mining is going to directly affect all of us, the animals and the plants, the water, everything. So it's an honor for me to be introducing uh, one of our, um, speakers and our speaker is Bunwapskel and in our language Bunwapskel is the Penobscot people and we've uh, for those of you that do not know we've inherited this region for over 12,000 years and I just want to share um, you know uh, 
a little bit about John Banks and what he has done to be able to um, address some of the issues that we're talking about today. And John Banks was the uh, director of the Department of Natural Resources for the Penobscot Nation, a federally recognized Indian tribe in Maine from 1980 to 2021. Mr. Banks has served the Penobscot Nation in his capacity since 1980, following the, the enactment of the Maine Indian Land Claim Settlement Act of 1980. As a natural resources director, Mr. Banks has developed and administered a comprehensive natural resources management program for his tribe, which advances an in integrated management approach in recognition of the interconnectedness of all things in the natural world. Let me say that again, which advances an integration, integrated management approach in recognition of the interconnectedness of all things in the natural world. Mr. Banks has served on many local, regional and national organization boards, including the National Tribal Environmental Council, National American Fish and Wildlife Societies, National Indian Police Center, and Tribal Operations Committee with the US EPA. Mr. Banks has a bachelor's degree in forest protection from the University of Maine, where he has awarded an Indian fellowship from the Office of Indian Education in Washington, DC. Mr. Banks was awarded the 2019 Distinguished Alumni Alumnus from the University of Maine School of Forest Resources. So it's an honor and privilege to uh, open the floor to uh, John Banks. So Chiwiliwin, John, for uh, being here with us uh, this evening. Yeah, Willie one, Dwayne, that's, that's a, a great uh, uh, words of wisdom to start us off here. And I very much appreciate uh, those words. And thank you for the great uh, introduction as well. Um, I'm not gonna talk very long because I'm very, very much uh, interested in listening to Winona tonight. I've known Winona for a long time. And she's, a, she's a great activist. But I did want to talk a little bit. Dwayne asked me to maybe talk a little bit about our experiences at Penobscot in um, trying to restore the ecological integrity of our homeland, uh, which for the Penobscot Nation is the Penobscot watershed, which is it covers about a third of the land area of the state of Maine. It uh, you know it drains. Uh, a third of the land area all the way from uh, Canada on, on the west side and from Canada on the east side as well. Um, and so, you know, as a Penobscot, many of us realize how, how we owe our existence to the Penobscot River. Penobscot River has allowed us to uh, prosper for 12,000 years, 10 to 12,000 years. And um, it's a real special place. And uh, many of our tribal folks understand that we have a responsibility to her to uh, clean, her up, clean her up and uh, do what we can to improve water quality uh, so that our children and grandchildren and everybody else's uh, children and grandchildren can enjoy this great gift from our creator. Um, the, tri the, the river gave the Penobscot Nation, like I said, everything it needed to survive. It was our highway to get to where we needed to get to gather our materials for daily living. It was our uh, network to carry on commerce with with other tribes uh, throughout the region. And um, it's really special. So when I went to work for the tribe in 1980, uh, <clears throat> started working on uh, some water quality issues. And at the time, there was a few paper mills discharging into our reservation. And one of the biggest issues that we had to tackle when we found out was the issue of the dumping of dioxin and related compounds 
from a craft paper mill. And uh, we <clears throat> mounted a campaign to uh, address that discharge. It was uh, discharging dioxin into the river. And at the time, dioxin was uh, understood to be one of the most potent human carcinogens that the governments had ever looked at. And we did a lot of testing of our fish downstream from that mill and the fish were loaded with dioxin. Uh, we did testing, I mean, we did uh, fish consumption studies of the tribal membership, which showed us that many tribal members were continuing to eat fish from the river. And we had a very high cancer rate uh, on, the, on the reservation. It was about twice the rate as the rest of the state. And so uh, we, uh, to make a long story short, <laughs> uh, we were successful in putting that mill into bankruptcy and they no longer discharge. And they've been out of business since about 2000. And what, how were we able to do that? How was the Penobscot Nation able to get such a, you know, such a place uh, in, that, in that whole process? Uh, you know, we filed uh, with the Department of Interior, we filed some natural resource damage claims, and we hired a company to do an assessment. Well, it wasn't a company, it was a, uh, university professor. It was the same guy that did the analysis uh, from the Exxon Valdez oil spill on the Alaskan natives. We hired him to do a assessment of the harm to the Penobscot nation from that particular discharge. And uh, it was a good study and it turned out uh, that the Penobscot nation was harmed a range of, I think it was like 60 to something over a hundred million dollars. And that's just on cultural damages. That's just on damage from not, you know, not being able to pass on cultural traditions from generation to generation because of the pollution. Uh, so that didn't even include any health benefits. I mean, health, uh, you know, health issues. Um, so that, uh, that was quite a campaign and uh, what we did was we emphasized the fact that the Penobscot Nation has sustenance fishing rights, which is a legal term. It's, uh, the tribe has reserved to itself the right to continue to take fish from our reservation waters uh, in every treaty that we've ever entered into, starting with Massachusetts and with Maine. Uh, so, uh, and then we also were able to use uh, our sustenance fishing rights as a tool in addressing some of the hydroelectric impacts on the river as well. Uh, there was recently uh, about a 15 to 20 year project. It was a $65 million project to address the hydro impacts to the Penobscot River watershed. And we, uh, purchased and took out the two lowermost dams on the Penobscot River, those being the VZ Dam and the Great Works Dam. And then we built a fish bypass channel around a third dam that's at the mouth of one of the sub drainages in Howland. And we've, uh, that's been a huge success. We have millions of alewives coming back now where before the project, there were very few. We have shad coming back. Uh, we have striped bass uh, coming all the way up to the reservation waters now. And there's been fisheries that have developed and there's been uh, alewives. Uh, the alewife story is a huge success. And ecologically speaking, the alewives are very important. They're like the, the key, what we call the keystone species is they feed just about everything else. And it only takes about, I understand from talking to fisheries people, it only takes about four out of a thousand alewives to keep the run going. So that leaves, you know, 996 alewives for everybody else. 
humans, eagles, otters, herons, all of the critters that we share the watershed with. So I just wanted to, you know, let folks know how important the recognition of tribal sustenance fishing rights can be uh, in some of these battles uh, to improve the ecological integrity and the water quality in, in these rivers. Um, so with that, I'm happy to introduce Winona Leduc. Uh, Winona is a Native American activist, an economist, an author. She's devoted her life to advocating for indigenous control of our homelands, natural resources, and cultural practices. She combines economic and environmental approaches in her efforts to create a thriving and sustainable community for her own white earth reservation, as well as indigenous populations across the country. Uh, Winona attended Harvard and graduated in 1982 with a degree in rural economic development. While at Harvard, uh, her interest in native issues grew. She spent a summer working on a campaign to stop uranium mining on Navajo land in Nevada and testified before the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland uh, concerning the exploitation of Indian lands. Uh, after Harvard, Winona took a position as principal of the Reservation High School at the White Earth Ojibwe Reservation in Minnesota. She soon became involved in a lawsuit filed by the Anishinaabeg people to recover lands promised to them by an 1867 treaty with the federal government. At the time of the treaty, the White Earth Reservation included about 837,000 acres, but government policies allowed lumber companies and other non-native groups to take over more than 90% of the land by 1934. After four years of litigation, however, the lawsuit was dismissed. The lawsuit's failure motivated uh, Winona uh, to ensure efforts to protect native lands. In 1985, she helped establish and co-chaired the Indigenous Women's Network, which is a coalition of 400 native women activists and groups dedicated to bolstering the visibility of native women and empowering them to take active roles in tribal politics and culture. Uh, that coalition strives both to preserve indigenous religions, religious and cultural practices, and to recover indigenous lands and conserve their natural resources. So I'm particularly uh, honored to be uh, introducing Winona today because she worked with us back in the uh, late 1990s. I mentioned the, the paper mill and the dioxin issue. Uh, Winona brought the Indigo Girls to Indian Island uh, to have a concert to bring awareness to this issue. So I'm thrilled, Winona, to have the chance to thank you again for that <laughs> and to introduce you. So thank you. That's the kindest thing, man. Well, you know, the thing is, John, I'm very uh, grateful for your introduction and to be here with you all. And, and uh, I have to laugh, though, because I'm, I'm, I'm 62 years old. So when you, when you get to 1985, I'm like, hey, buddy, it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. We're good. <laughs> nice to see you, John. Nice to see you, Dwayne. Nice to be here with you, Severin, all of you, you know, here. Ani Nindawe Muganaduk, Binesi Kwe and Jinikaz, Makwondo Dam, Gababani Ka, Gish Kaniganing, Indun Jaba, Miigwich, Miigwich, Miigwich. Thanks so much. Happy to be with you, my relatives. You know, uh, those, the people of the East, the Penobscot, the Passamaquoddies are my relatives. And so I do say, especially, hello, my relatives, you are my, my older ones, you know, my older ones. So um, um, very nice to be here with you all. So I am um, happy to uh, 
join you. I want to, you know, talk a little bit about this time in our time. And I'm here from our, from my, at our farm, our hemp farm here on the, on the, on the south side of the White Earth Reservation. And uh, it's a good day. It's a good day. It's a, it's a Minugishgad Agua Ching. It's a, it's a warm day. We're getting into the sucker moon. You know, we live in a similar ecosystem. I see snow outside there. I also, much snow. I'm very grateful for it. It was a very tough last year, you know, with the drought, worst drought in the history of our state. And they say it's the worst drought for 1200 years, you know, that they're having in this country right now and particularly in the Southwest. And I just want to say that because I feel like it's super important to, uh, you know, kind of acknowledge the state of the world, you know, that we are in. And uh, on one hand, grateful every day that I'm here and that the creator gave us Zugi Poon, Agua Ching, there is, there is snow and that I was riding horses with my grandchildren and it was about 10 degrees, but that was nice, you know, grateful I could do those things and live in this good life here the creator gave us. And then also, you know, grateful to be with you over there. So in our time, our prophecies, this is called the time of the seventh fire. And I'm just gonna start with that because it's told to us that we at this time will have a choice between two paths. They said one path will be well-worn and scorched. The other path will not be well-worn, but it will be green. And it will be our choice upon which path to embark. That's what our prophets told us really long time ago. And I'm pretty much gonna go with their, their spot on because <laughs> that's where we're at. We're, that's a wrap. You know, and it's not just like a native thing. It's not just a Anishinaabe thing here. You know, it's really this moment in time uh, that we are in. And, you know, that is really plays out in this Northland territory, the Northland, whether it is called the Ring of Fire for the Canadian multinationals that look, you know, to the Northern territories for all their latest bits of unobtainium, or else it is, you know, the, the, you know, the, 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 the other, you know, every, every facet of this territory, you know, the, the waters of the North, the waters and, and all that is here, you know, so it is playing out here. It is playing out across these territories in full force, this moment in time. And um, at the same time, as our prophecies talked about this, we have this pandemic. And I really think about it because if you look out there, we all know this, that the times we are in are epic times. Creator apparently thought this is our time. So we're here. <laughs> and nice to see you, John Banks, that you're still here after all these years, rocking it, you know, man. That's what happens when you have stability, a tribal government, and you leave your natural resources guy in there. Don't mess with him. Let him take care of your land for three, four decades, right? You know? Good takes good care, man. Takes good care. Thank you uh, for taking care of Inda King and Bin, the very land to which we belong, the very land to which we belong. But I want to say that, you know, in this moment we are in, we have catastrophes of biblical proportions all around us. <laughs> we have fires to the west, we have, you know, hurricanes and tidal waves to the south, we have political disasters of, of, you know, insurrection proportions to the east, and and we have you know ice caps melting, and then we have a pandemic <laughs> in the middle of it. Every bit of this, you know, is absolute crisis, and in that you also have social movements that are just done. They are just done, and I'm just saying, you know, you are seeing this massive, you know, resistance of people that are saying we're kind of done with that way of thinking transformation of power is occurring you know we just had you know all this uh, this battle you know i just want to take a moment and say how grateful i am that all those columbus statues have fallen down you know i mean i'm just saying that there's a social movement of consciousness that is in the middle of these 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 crises that exist all around us so i say that and then i say Aaron Dottie Roy, the Indian writer, talks about pandemic as portal. And she says that in the history of the world, pandemics have always forced societies to change. This one is no different. Each time a pandemic has come to us, to people, we had to change everything. And here we are in a fabulous Zoom world, you know? 
there was not, you know, there is a prophecy about Zoom too. And I bet Dwayne knows that Hopi prophecy about the web in the sky. I was <laughs> like, right? You know what I'm saying? But I'm saying, look, we're in this really this time where all these things are changing. And she says, a pandemic is a portal between one world and the next. And she says, it is a portal. And in that portal, she says, what are you going to take through the portal with you? Are you going to take your prejudices, your avarice, your dirty, your data banks, your dirty rivers? Or are you going to walk through clean? That's this. That's the same moment we have everywhere. And it's the moment we are facing with these multinational Canadian corporations coming to our territories. You know, it is the same moment. We talk about the seventh fire and the lighting of the eighth fire, you know, and what we have, we are looking at an economic system which is failing across the board in the middle of every other crisis that is around. And what I am saying, you know, I'm up here living on a farm trying to figure out how much food to grow for communities and how to rebuild local food systems because we all know the answer is the green path. The green, you know, is, 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 the, is, is what we are working on. So having said this, the other side is still in the late stage Wendigo capitalism problem. <laughs> I don't know how else to call it, but it's just like the very end of the barrel, the bottom of the barrel, the last fracked aquifer, you know, some crazy new mining project for unobtainium. I mean, that's at least what they call it an avatar, you know? I mean, it's like unobtainium. But um, so here we are, Minnesota just kicked out two big mining projects. Do I get a high five for that? I did very little, I did very little, but I just wanna say, you know, I was like, go team. Minnesota just had Twin Metals Project and Polymet Project, Canadian and like Chilean and Swiss multinational dinosaur bad idea people coming to the Boundary Waters, right? We are now facing the Tamarack Mine, which is Rio Tinto Zinc, backing some half-baked Canadian multinational known as Talent Mine, right? Same place we just fought the pipeline out of same place we fought the pipeline out of, they come back with this bad idea, you know? So we are right with you in the challenge that we are faced. And you know what they wanna take? Oh, they wanna say that they are here for green power because they want the nickel for the batteries, right? So I am with you all in the same conundrum, right? And so oh, as I look out there, we're working on the same thing. And there's a lot of people that are working on the same thing because, you know, you know, I used to, I used to like quoting, well, I just quote him now because I'm, I can, Eduardo Galeano. He's a, he is a, a Latin American scholar, super smart guy. And he said one time in the colonial to neo-colonial alchemy, gold changes to scrap metal and food to poison. We have become painfully aware of the mortality of wealth, which nature bestows and imperialism appropriates. Open veins of Latin America. Look, you know, what am I saying? Indigenous people, we got this little speck of land left, the remaining biodiversity of the planet held by indigenous people, right? 75% of the world's biodiversity. If you wanna hang out for another, you know, we'll just take, maybe you wanna try a thousand years humans, I don't know. You want to hang out like a thousand years? You might want to protect that biodiversity, which means you got to work with indigenous people, right? That's why we're all here. We're going to roll up our sleeves. So this is what we think. First of all, you know, their idea is bad and they have bad math and they got old data. What am I trying to say? I was just over there at UMass Amherst this last week. I kid you not. I went to see these genius guys, like there was a lab and stuff like that, some kind of a thing. But anyway, I've been working with them for about three years. I send my hemp, right? I tell you this, I send my hemp to them. And because hemp, y'all know what I'm talking about? Not the stuff that you are smoking, the stuff that it looks like this. This is fiber hemp. Do you see this fiber hemp? I'm a fiber hemp grower, right? All right, make long story short. 
these this here stuff because it grows so fast it's a giant carbon sink and it sucks all the carbon down into the plant and then when you burn it like biochar this stuff here apparently is what they're after i don't really understand the full thing but anyway make long story short it's a super high graphene that you could use for electrical uh, super capacitors and for batteries <gasps> hemp batteries did y'all hear what i said hemp batteries two years maybe out two years maybe out then you know let's just go to the fact that their idea of using the nickel lithium stupidity idea which is kind of the end of the dinosaur practices in the batteries that's like old technology there's like sodium batteries that are more efficient than that there's like oh that's right they just figured out that you take the batteries out of the flipping landfill and you take them and you totally re you 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 take it apart and it's a cathode whatever it is that cathode part like it's disintegration somehow makes it even better it's kind of like super good uh leftovers you know yeah it's it, it it makes it better you know so what am i saying that these guys these canadian multinationals are trying to do this unobtainium thing they're looking for something that in two years the technology will have surpassed their fabulously bad idea right so what we need to do you know we're all signed up for the green economy, the green path of our ancestors instructions. You know, everybody here who is on this call, no matter what color you are, you know, you're all here because you're doing the same thing. You're trying to stop them from doing something stupid so that we can protect our water so that we can continue to live, right? So our strategy, first of all, let's just start education, a lot of work on exactly how BS this green new, new technology is you know, with how BS this project is. Like over here, they say this, that, you know, just the more that you, that my experience, cause I'm old, my experience is like the longer you fight these projects, the more expensive they get, right? And, and money, these guys is all about money. You know, if they can't get their project in yesterday, there's some other bad project they're gonna try to put in. So, you know, like us, we just fought Enbridge for seven years, eight years, eight years out of my life. Talk about like doing time. You know, I don't even like Canadian multinationals. I just spent eight years in this super dysfunctional battering relationship, appearing at every single hearing, every regulatory moment, every le legal case, every like petition, every BS Zoom hearing that they had where they would like say, oh, one minute, nope, can't do it. You know, it was like a total, it was, uh, I think the word is regulatory capture. That's what happens when a Canadian multinational takes over your regulatory system. And they buy the system, they buy the Public Utilities Commission, you know, they, they go in and get the public, you know, pollution control agency, everybody in there, and then they go in and then the corporation goes in and starts divvying up your people. That's what they did over here in Minnesota. You know, they got Fond du Lac that already had six pipes running through them to say, oh, yeah, we'll take some more money. You know, they lathered more money up here than the history of their project, right? So they do all this kind of dirty stuff to get their thing through. And they finally did, you know, thousand people arrested. Me, myself, I've got charges in three counties up here, you know? And, uh, you know, a lot of us water protectors, you know, we're just, you know, I want my charges dropped and I want a medal. That's what I want. You know, that's what I deserve. I want a medal for protecting the waters, you know, but anyway, not my story here, your story. My point is, is that this is now the most expensive, the most expensive pipeline ever put in. You don't get a TR for that in the investment world, do you? Putting in the most expensive pipeline that ever was at the end of the tar, at the end of the tar sands era, you don't get a TR for that. You know, this corporation's now trying to put in a pipeline in through Michigan, Cross Bad River in Wisconsin, you know, expensive, expensive. So, you know, their ideas are bad. And what you do is you keep battling those ideas. So, you know, that's what we got to do. We're all in for you, you know, to stand there. In the meantime, you know, what we want is the next generation of batteries. What we want is the hemp ones that don't mess up anybody's ecosystem, you know, and help bioremediate. 
you know, and then, uh, you know, and it'd save a lot of your problems up there because after, after all, it's like four times as much fiber as wood in the same acreage, four times as much fiber as wood or timber in the same acreage and grows, oh, that's right, one year, the same amount that the wood take, would take to grow 20 years. Wait, did y'all hear what I said? Like hemp is the way, it's the future. Right now, I don't know how much years out there, but what you want to do is keep your force and what we want to do is grow hemp. You know, I'm just saying that there are answers out there and we just keep fighting and working on them. And then the other thing I just want to say is, is that, you know, there are some regulatory systems. You guys are talking about the prove it first litigate, you know, legal system. You know, I have to say, I might have to defer to other attorneys on that. I'm not an attorney on that. You know, my work is mostly on the rights of nature and the rights of wild rice here. You know, and Wisconsin has some of the best um, anti-mining anti um, legislation in the country, although they've been trying to strip a lot of things. And Minnesota is just a very, very tough, tough situation because our wild rice is, is paramount to this ecosystem. And you can't put a mine in where there's wild rice. Now, I don't know how that would affect you all out there, you know, but that's something to think about. You know, if wild rice is protected here, perhaps it is protected there. You know, but more than that, I want to say that our tribe in the um, 2019, I think it was, passed the rights of wild rice as a part of our uh, tribal uh, governing th authority. In December of that year, our tribal government Pass the rights of wild rice, recognizing wild rice a right to flourish, to be free of contamination, free of genetic contamination, you know, a right to right to continue to, to regenerate. Now, in uh, August 4th of 2021, our tribe, um, our tribal government into the tribal court found that Monoman or wild rice filed a lawsuit against the state of Minnesota for the violation of the rights of wild rice. As cited specifically the Minnesota DNR, Department of Natural Resources, which had stolen the waters of Minnesota for the wild rice, uh, uh, from the wild rice for the Canadian Mining Corporation. That is to say that in the deepest drought in the history of the state of Minnesota, did you hear what I said? The deepest drought in the history of the state of Minnesota, they gave away 5 billion gallons of water to Enbridge, the multinational you know, oil corporation. That was criminal. So what I mean, these are criminal Canadian corporations. Wait, let me say that one more time. These are criminal Canadian corporations. That's what they are. And that's what we need to un have a people understand who is proposing these things, you know? And, um, you know, so, so what I know is that our tribe took them into court. They said, oh no, that's not right. They, they made all these arguments. This is my impersonation of the state of Minnesota DNR. Oh, this is really not right. We don't like this. We don't like this. That's how they acted. They went and they, they wrote that kind of in a memo though to tribal court. And then they appealed to the federal court and the federal court said, you got to go back to tribal court. Why are you here? You're presently in a venue. And so there's this battle going on in Northern Minnesota over if the state can be pulled into tribal court or not. I don't know how these things are gonna go, you know? But what I do know is, is, that, is that, you know, the question of the rights of mother earth is really the fundamental question. You know, you need to have stronger mining laws there in Northern, um, you know, in, in Maine as we do here. But fundamentally the question comes to be who has the right, you know? And as we look out there across the world, we see that you know, whether it starts in Ecuador in 2008 with the rights of Mother Earth declared as a part of their constitution or the country of Bolivia in 2010 declares rights of Mother Earth as a part of their constitution. Then New Zealand, you know, declares the rights of the river, you know, there in their country, you know, similarly, you know, followed by, you know, actions then in, in uh, the Yurok tribe followed our tribe with the rights of the rights of the river and the uh, Seattle tribe, you know, also challenged um, talking about the rights of the salmon. So to me, this question that is here now is a very interesting question. You know, I am fully aware being 62 years of age of the legal system that has come to bear 
in the United States. And I'm gonna say something which I'm sure that Dwayne and also John understand is that that's not how you manage stuff. You know, this system is crazy. You know, it's predicated on things from the, you know, doctrine of discovery, you know, the papal rights, the idea of, you know, dominion, all of those, all of those issues to the present situation where what has happened is that the violence of the technology, whether that is nuclear testing in the Pacific or fracking aquifers, exceeds any regulatory experience of the nation state which purports to be able to regulate it. In other words, the technology is way deeper than anyone's fathoms in the intergenerational contamination which is caused by reckless corporate behavior. And so what has happened is, is that what we see clearly is that the rights of corporations supersede the rights of all of us in this country. That's very clear. You know, corporations are deemed to be natural persons under the law. And I just was faced arrest and I have charges in three counties because of a Canadian multinational. And there's idea to throw a private pipeline over our territory for a private benefit, adding plenty of carbon, the equivalent of 50 new coal-fired power plants. Crime against humanity and a crime of ecocide is what these corporations are committing. There is no court except for in Papua New Guinea that now recognizes the crime of ecocide. But that's what these corporations are, are committing. They use our crimes of ecocide. You know, but instead we have the idea that a corporation, that their rights should supersede the rest of us. And what we all know is that a corporation is not a person under a law because the person, a person like me, a human has a soul. <laughs> a corporation does not have a soul. It has no rights. Having kind of gone on that deep discussion, let me just say that I think it was in December of last year, the Ecuadorian Constitutional Court upheld the rights of Mother Earth. Did you just hear what I said? The Ecuadorian Constitutional Court upheld the rights of Mother Earth. That's exactly what they did. A Canadian corporation. How many times have you heard me say a Canadian corporation during this discussion? That's one rogue economy with a set of bad ideas that precedes residential schools quite a bit. You know, it's a brutal country. Quit acting like they're cute. The only thing they got good is a healthcare system. <laughs> right? Besides that, how'd they get to be the maple syrup cartel? What are you doing, Maine? Get back to your maple syrup tiara. Right, exactly. Canada owns 75% of the international mining corporations, right? And so you and I are facing the same thing. We're facing Canadian mining corporations, Junior, ours, Talon, you know, and what do they got? 75% of the world's mining corporations are now Canadian because, you know, they're going after the scraps from their extractive economy. They commit massive human rights violations against indigenous people in El Salvador, you know, in Brazil, in Colombia, throughout Central America, indigenous land defenders, you know, have been killed in Guatemala. Many of those crimes were committed by Canadian multinationals. You know, tell these stories, tell these stories. They have no social license to come to our communities. They, commit, they have committed crimes and they continue to commit crimes. In the meantime, what they're looking for isn't gonna be no good by the time they try to get to dig a hole. <laughs> you know, what we need to do is make the next economy. Not wait until the next lame Canadian multinational comes in with their next lame idea. You know, I mean, I, I don't know how to say it, you guys, but I think that Dwayne and John, those guys got the best economic plans of all. I mean, you don't get to live someplace for 10,000 years and not know how to get around, right? You know, add in that hemp and 
You know, I mean, I see, I was up there. I see that you legalize cannabis too. You know, I'm just saying, grow everything your own, grow local, rebuild your economy. You know, that's kind of a simple answer, but that's really the answer, the only answer in the time of climate change and in the answer when we, when we have this choice between two paths. It's not like something else, you know, and how we get there, everybody on this call, you know, every, everyone on this call, you know, has, is, has seen this and seen the same line, you know, and there's two paths, you know, and uh, one of those paths is the path that Canada's on. They got the last tar sands pipeline. We got the last mining corporations, you know, and indigenous people, land defenders are fighting up there like heck too. So just keep standing our ground, keep standing our ground, starve the, starve the Wendigo, starve the cannibal, you know, take their stuff away. And in the meantime, just plant a lot of hemp, you know, plant a lot of food in those seeds is spirit, in those seeds is spirit, you know, take care of our soil, clean stuff up. That hemp bioremediates, John, did you try that yet? I don't know, man, maybe you should try that down there by the river. I'm, does they're doing tests on it on Navajo too, you know? I'm just saying potential, the future's green. New green revolution, that's what we call it. And besides that, we're happy to be here with you. And I think that I've talked way long enough, but I wanna thank you so much for your time. You good. Willie Wynn, G. Willie Wynn, we wanna thank you very much for, um, for being here today and your time. And we really appreciate um, you know, uh, the same struggles that we're struggling and universally people are struggling with. And uh, we appreciate all your efforts that you're doing uh, in your territory. And thank you so much for being with us today. Kachi Willie Wynn. And also, I'd, be, I'd like to also acknowledge, I, I do believe we had the uh, tribal representative. Um, uh, I just wanted to recognize her just to let her know that, uh, you know, she also submitted a bill uh, in the legislature, a water bill, so I just wanted to acknowledge her, let her know that, you know, I, I seen her on uh, online here just to let her know, um, you know, that we appreciate her efforts in the legislature and trying to address uh, the water issue as well. So thank you very much to Arena Newell from the uh, tribal representative in the Passamaquoddy tribe in the legislature. And thank you, thank you to Winona and, um, and thank you to all who've been here locally working to pass the ordinance and get the vote out and spread the word to the fishermen and the farmers and all the people who depend on the living world um, for their livelihoods, which is a pretty high percentage of the people here in super rural Washington County. 10% of residents hold a commercial fishing license of some kind here. This is the, the best scallop bed in the whole state of Maine and this bay produces the majority of the farmed salmon is the biggest producer of farmed salmon in the whole state of Maine. So even those bays that are trying to keep farmed salmon out, the farmed salmon that's here would be imperiled by the mine that wants to go in. So we need all of us working together to make our voices loudly heard. Um, this is a very important moment to have those voices loudly heard and the unity of all these struggles in Maine seems to be pretty important. As I hear Winona calling, us to um, see as illegitimate the greed that arrives from these companies into our home places, wanting to carve profit out of the mountain and ruin the river. That's an illegitimate request. And so in the same way, it's illegitimate that the, you know, farms, friends of mine are now not able to farm because their land has been ruined by the spreading of sludge, the PFAS sludge all across the state of Maine. So contamination is really in the news right now. Meanwhile, in Goldsboro and in, in Frenchman Bay, Millinocket and Belfast, all of these eight proposed salmon farms, again, citizens are uniting and rising to say, no, we don't want your factory salmon pens, Nordic corporations. We don't want your um, GMO soybeans being trucked in from the Midwest to come and allow these fish to poop in our, our beautiful bays. And so it seems like there's all these different, the same, it's all these different people who are working in the same way to try and protect our clean water. So now this is a time where we can ask questions um, of one another and share perspectives and voices, observations, 
um, I'm sure people who have other campaigns that they want to draw attention to or that are allied will do so. But I thought it's nice that we have the opportunity to have an open forum and more voices since we ha often are, well, it's a bit lonely organizing during COVID. So now at least we are together through this. The floor is open. Thank you, Severin. This is John. I just wanted to mention that I put a link in the chat. It's a YouTube video about the Picket Mountain uh, mine proposal uh, out in Western Maine that threatens the headwaters of the Mattawamkeag River, which flows into the Penobscot River. And it's the same company. It's Wolfden Mining, who's um, doing the project down there in Pembroke as well. And uh, so I just wanted to, if anyone's interested in getting caught up on where that project is. Yeah, and one of the concerns that was voiced in the most recent Quadi Tides was that in the Land Use Planning Committee um, Commission hearing, Wolfden referred to their operations here in Pembroke as a place where they could truck their tailings in order to please the regulators um, of the Picket Mountain operation that they could put stack their tailings here in, in our watershed. And that's caused um, more people around here to start to notice. But the, the, the ore body here, they say is 10 times bigger than up there, but there, there's guys out on the road every day wearing yellow vests, mapping out, they're putting electron uh, lines of, it's called um, polarization and it sends electrical charges into the ground so they can sense what metals are there and digging new holes and buying new land and acquiring new mineral rights, um, expanding their base of operations here um, as it starts to warm up again. So we're very watchful and we're working to pass our local ordinance, but we are gonna need a pretty big state response. Okay, look, I'm talking again, I better hush. Somebody else wanna raise their hand or unmute? I just want to say thanks again to Winona, and I'm always uh, inspired when she speaks. Uh, so it was great to, to hear her, and I might have to come out of retirement now after listening to her. <laughs> Thank you, Winona. Severin, one thing, probably Winona said it, but I didn't catch it. Why are there so many corporations, mining corporations in Canada? That the one's for you, Winona. Um, you know, if you look at Canada's history has been, a let's call a staples economy. That's its whole history. All the roads go north, south. It's basically just extracted stuff from the north and, and in the north is where most of the native people live, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it's just kind of the mindset of, of, of Canadian colonialism. And so, you know, in, even the dam projects that we were all involved with fighting in the 80s, in the 90s, they have other dam projects. Um, in this last stage of, you know, what there is left to extract, yeah, they've got, they've got capital that comes out of tar sands, it comes out of stuff, and they've, you know, it's just kind of like their gig. So it's not that the laws are so lenient that other, the companies from other lands come and incorporate in, uh, in Canada. No, that's Canadian, that's just okay, pure Canadian. Canadian. Okay. We're jerks. That's just pure Canadian stuff. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, I, I just have to point it out because it's like, there's a lot of like fallacies. Like, they're nice up there. No, they aren't. You know, they aren't nice to Indigenous people. They aren't nice to the environment. You know, and, and, um, and, and we all deserve more. So the, that's point one. Point two is, is that, is that a lot of the the, you know, if you can, if you, if you can see where your enemy is, right, then that's where you, that's part where you got to push and, and just watching the, you know, that whole economic situation up there, 
you know, uh, like I said, you know, you guys just stand for your water. That's all we got. That's what our job is. Stand for our water, you know? Anyway, thank I'm going to get out of this before I be helping no, you. Guys. Don't get out before we say thank you for me also, but not only for the talking, but also because, you know, we're spending a lot of time in the young farmer world trying to regenerate and restore and grow local food economies and build resilience and feed our communities. And you're showing us that we have to be water fighters as well as farmers. And that is something I think is not necessarily native to the kind of impulse of a lot of young people who I am familiar with in organic agriculture. We're like, we're wanting to grow the new farm. We want to grow the baby creatures. We want to plant all our seedlings and to have to do the seedlings and fight and fight at the same time. That's a lot. And I think it's a lot for all of us to have to fight as well as um, mourn. And you're showing us that it can be done with such dignity. Um, you know, I mean, I, I do my best, but you know, you have to remember where y'all come from. I mean, we all come from people who, you know, had a lot of things that they had to do in their history, you know? And, um, you know, I mean, it's kind of like, um, you know, we, 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 we could do the right thing. We can do the right thing. And you got to draw on those lessons and, 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 and that, and, uh, you know, I see change coming, you know, from a lot of places, you know, but in that, like, I have to say that my balance is, I mean, did I, did I say earlier that I went, I was riding horse with my grandsons? I mean, that's like it, right. You know, I get to live this life, you know, I get to live a good life. And that's what we really, this is about is being able to keep that life good, which isn't something you buy at a mall. You know, we're on Amazon, right? It's your water, right? So to me, you know, that's this great moment where you get to stand up for that and 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 might as well live it while you're doing it. I mean, I'm talking to y'all in Maine, man. We we like you guys got all kind of cool stuff up there. You're like us, right? You know, but that hemp, think about hemp, okay? I know you guys got other stuff, but I'm just gonna say that is really the answer to some things. I don't know how much because your food thing, you know, I'm not in your farm thing, but. Look at our stuff on, on him. Miigwech. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Winona. You really win. Miigwech. The floor is, the floor is still open. I wanted to, um, I have an event announcement for the next meeting to learn more. And the next session is March 26th. So I'll put that in the chat, but if somebody else wants to pipe up, this is a good time. Ms. Irain, I have to tell you that in the 70s, we grew organic farming and got Mothka started and we got the state to define what organic was. And we fought nuclear plants and we fought rampant aerial spraying. And that's how come it's so open for young farmers today. So I hope they see that and carry forward for us. Thank you. There are three people that have their electric hands up waiting. Oh, I better, who, who's, I guess it, it must be my job. Tim, Bird and Tim. Diane. I see Tim. And then Bird and Diane have had and their And then hands. I see Bird and I see Diane. At least on the all first right. page. Thank you. And thanks for all of our, our speakers. Um, my question is for Dwayne and, and any of the other Passamaquoddy folks that are on the call today. Um, the way that um, Winona talked about how wild rice was really the, the core for them of their cultural heritage and their, and their ecosystem what would be the equivalent for the Passamaquoddy people as like the, the thing that you would give rights to if you could control the legal system in Maine? I mean, that's a, that's a real good question. I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, number one, um, Pollock were very plentiful to our people. Matter of fact, when our people used to go to the shores, the, um, the, um, the Pollock were just bubbling. 
They were just bubbling on the shores. And today, that's not so. And the reason why that's not so is because of the legal, legal infrastructure that's, that's designed to exterminate those things and, and because of greed and these big corporations coming in and also uh, all these dams not allowing the natural uh, habitat to go in their spawning places. I mean, there are many, many factors, but just to give you an example of some of the deterioration that's going on, the extermination that's going on and the effects that are going on with, with the laws that are being applied, not just to indigenous people, but universally. Thank you. The next was Bird and then Diane. Hey all, um, thank you so much again for the speakers. Hearing Winona talk was just mind blowing. Um, I'm Birdie Velveteen. Um, I live in Eastport. Uh, I am a steering committee member for kind of a newish coalition um, called Diversity Down East. Uh, we came together when we started to notice some real municipal dysfunction that uh, that was impacting um, local uh, you know, LGBT communities, working class communities. We're very intersectional and this is very much a, a, a struggle we want to plug into from a lot of angles. Uh, you know, um, we're, we're, very, we're very committed to this. So please, if anyone has any asks for us, um, we're pretty active in writing letters to the editor and the Quaddy Tides. If anyone has any labor they want to redistribute, you know, to us, please let us know. We're, we're ready to plug in. Thank you so much for already what you've done. But um, Birdie got, volunteered to run the Facebook page of this whole process. Diane. Hey, thank you all. Thanks, Birdie. God bless the young people who can deal with Facebook. Um, I just want to say that uh, uh, you know we as Andy put in the in the chat, if we pass the Pine Tree Amendment with a two thirds majority, uh, you know. Uh, Wolfton and, and company have no grounds. I mean, we have a complete legal basis, I, as I understand it, to a, a block anything like this. And um, so everybody, please, if you haven't, contact your legislators, uh, do whatever you can, letters to the editors, speak it up, speak it up. And, um, and I also, I mean, if we don't pass that, I mean, I know Ralph Chapman's on the call and he's got a long history of experience in the legislature fighting uh, watered down mining regulation. I'd love to hear his thoughts. Um, just thanks everybody. I see Andy's hand up and that was a call for Ralph to get in line. <laughs> Thanks. I think it's you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for organizing this. And it's wonderful to see so many people here. I put in the chat uh, a plug for the Pine Tree Amendment. Uh, we're coming down to the wire. Uh, we are going to be in Augusta on Wednesday uh, when the uh, legislature will be in session. And we're expecting a vote in um, mid-March. The Pine Tree Amendment is uh, uh, designed to put, it is actually an amendment to the Declaration of Rights that would um, enshrine there uh, the rights for all of us to uh, clean air, clean water, and uh, healthy environment. And one of the things that excites me about this amendment is that it is also for future generations. It, <clears throat> uh, I, I love what Winona has said and the nations in the world like Ecuador that have gone forward with the idea of the rights of mother earth. Um, this still has an anthropocentric ring to it, but it could be a really important first step uh, for um, to ad 
for us to really put power back to people uh, to protect uh, the very basic needs we all have uh, for life um, of good water and, and uh, good air. So um, <clears throat> we, uh, Chloe Maxman, Senator Chloe Maxman is the chief sponsor, Rena Newell, Representative Rena Newell is one of the uh, signers, the one of the uh, co-sponsors, and uh, we it has bipartisan uh, support. But right now, uh, any calls to legislators, and I put the um, I, I put the website address in the chat. Um, you can go on and sign a letter if you're a farmer, if you're a youth, if you're a grandparent. Uh, we're going to be bringing these to the legislature with a conference, a uh, press conference, and it's been really exciting to have youth and uh, our indigenous friends, Wabanaki friends, uh, involved. Thank you, John. Thanks for your wonderful interview. Uh, we've been playing it all over. So thanks a lot and um, bless you all. Thanks. So if that passes, we'll have grounds to to sue under it to prevent this mine going forward. Uh, Shri Verrill, you're up next. Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see some familiar faces. Thank you for the presentation. Um, thank you for bringing us together um, around this. And it, it, um, what strikes me in the, the connection between, in general, environmental damage and specifically um, the environmental damage of this mining is the, the connection with economic democracy and the importance that the decisions of people in the community not be determined by those outside of the community and that the wealth of the community not leak outside to um, centralized locations. And so it strikes me that the, the four pillars of economic democracy provide an excellent framework to explain the connection between the ecosystem and the community damages and the environmental um, effects. So um, I just wanna throw that out there and I am working on a um, webinar that will train people on the four principles of economic democracy to use as a lens to evaluate policies, politicians, projects. And just real quickly, the first principle is the five basic necessities. All people have the rights to health care, education, clean food, clean water, medicine. And the second is the purchasing power to live a dignified life. The third is decisions need to be made by those affected by them within the concept of subsidiarity, which means this local smallest group of experts guide the decision making. And the fourth is that there's no leakage of wealth from the community to the outside or interference. And I say no, but we try to limit it. And so if you look at those, if you look at the proposed mining or the exploitive practices um, that others have mentioned, the, the connection between access to land and access to water and our ability to govern our own sovereign, you know, to, to exhibit sovereignty, our intrinsic rights um, can be, I think, better articulated with, with using those principles. So I hope that's helpful. Um, I'll leave you there. <laughs> I'll put, I'll be in contact with the organizers to see if that's an, um, folks who are interested might like to sign up for that. Thank you very much. Chris, you're next. We need your audio.
I wanted to, while we're, while Chris is working on getting audio going, I see that Ralph is down there. Maybe you could explain a little bit as why, why do we need such a big group of people to be tuned into the issue of mining in Maine? And why is it such a project to um, subst substantially um, update the rule of law and our enforcement of the rule of law? Well, thank you, Severine. Um, we've uh, fought battles in the legislature around environmental protection, and it's particularly around mining and the mining regulations. And contrary to what has been said about Maine's mining regulations, um, they cannot work because the framework uh, is not suitable for regulating the mining industry. And I'll try to expand upon that in more detail in a written form in the future. But I do want to give a quick shout out to uh, Sri Verrill. At the time, she was working with Maine Rivers. And I've often said that not only the premier environmental organization of the state, but another 30 some additional organizations supported the current mining laws, which are atrociously poor. But the exception was Maine Rivers. And I, uh, Congratulate Sri for having what I believe was her influence in that decision on the part of Maine Rivers. So I don't know if I ever had a chance to thank you for that, Sri, but I have the opportunity now, so I've done it. Um, and, and I'd be happy to answer any other questions about the status of uh, Maine's mining laws, which as I say, are totally inadequate and uh, uh, for the, the job they purport to do. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. For, Ralph has been giving his um, expertise away um, consistently over the last year to uh, in many venues. If you wanted to listen to his talk um, at the Blue Hill Teach-In and over Zoom from the Pembroke Clean Water, you can really get a lot of background on the struggle that has been ongoing now for many, many years. Um, a group of people have been really very grateful to meet and their commitment and their foresight to protect our waters from threats that do exist in the form of the Callahan mine and threats that are still looming, like the one here, big, um, what they call Big Silver or Big Hill. Um, I see Chris and then I see Jan. We'll come back to you after Jan. Hi, yeah, thanks, uh, Severin. And this has been really fantastic and I really appreciate um, all that we were able to learn today. Just kind of thinking back to my Nona's presentation, I, I have a question for John and Dwayne thinking about, or others on the call that might be able to, to chime in, thinking about how indigenous peoples are the stewards of biodiversity and how indigenous peoples um, are the ones best suited to protect biodiversity. I'm wondering if there are initiatives in Maine that we who are non-Indigenous people should be supporting and showing up for as allies to be able to um, allow the tribes to be able to, to have that um, role as, as stewards of, of biodiversity. I'm thinking about like, would the tribal sovereignty law be a good way to actually combat a silver mine in down east Maine and, and what are maybe other ways that those of us that are not indigenous can support that work to make that happen. Well I think uh, today is a great example of what can be done bringing uh, tribal folks together look from you know, from Maine as well as Winona and others. Uh, this is a great example of exactly that. Uh, you know, folks working together, sharing stories, educating each other on uh, issues of tribal sovereignty. And like I was talking about earlier, uh, recognizing and supporting uh, tribal sustenance fishing rights uh, as a legal issue uh, can go a long way toward protecting our water resources in this state. I'm sure Dwayne has some, some thoughts there as well. 
important to say, um, I think collectively, you know, because this really affects all of us and for us to be able to uh, contact our legislators and our, you know, our senators and all the people that make the decisions, you know, how it impacts, you know, all of us, because this really does impact each and every one of us. I mean, the water is so uh, critical to all of us. So, you know, and this isn't um, nothing, un, you know, nothing new, you know, I just think we need to all collectively come together and having opportunities like this is absolutely wonderful to be able to reach out to others and to be able to bring more of a, um, uh, you know, a solid mind as far as everybody coming together of one mind um, to start, um, you know, enacting uh, laws to protect uh, the salmon, you know, let the uh, salmon and let the water have a day, you know, um, sort of like what Winona was um, talking about, you know, and that's nothing uncommon because we've been saying that now for a long time is that, is that um, we're all connected and the animals and the plants and the water, um, uh, they need a say and we should have, you know, let them have a say in what, what goes on here and us to protect that. So the animals have a say and all of us who are here um, need to make sure that our voices stay in this mix as we continue once the ordinance comes in Pembroke, then the ordinance goes in Denny'sville, it goes in Charlotte, it's got to go. Um, there's got to be DEP watchfulness. There's a lot ahead of us here in confronting this mine and there's only 600 people in this town. So um, it's a lot for um, it's a lot for us to handle. One of the one of the requests um, has been that there if there's some people who are on this call who'd like to get involved in a grassroots volunteer kind of way of actually doing stuff, um, there's definitely an opportunity for stuff that needs doing. Um, so if that might describe you, please, please be in touch. That means letters to the editor. Um, it means canvassing, it means fundraising. And um, we've been very happy to um, be splitting legal costs with the Pasmaquoddy tribe in the work that's gone on so far, they were right there ready to vote and say this is a priority for the tribe. So grateful for all the neighbors who've mobilized. Um, so grateful for the fishermen who've mobilized and gone out and talked to their friends and explained the situation to them. So it's really through those actions that we can spread our, you know, have enough power to resist. And, and the example that, that John shows us of how long the struggle is to fight to stop the poison once it starts and that we need to stop the poison before it starts here if we can. So I don't wanna go on too long. I see that I wanna make sure Dwayne gets a chance for a last word. Okay. Anybody else? I just wanted to say one thing in response to Winona's uh, appeal to grow hemp. Uh, in our history books in Maine, I've been told by historians that when the legislature, the early legislature, like in the mid 1800s, there was discussions. And apparently this is written down somewhere because it's been brought to my attention where there was discussions about what is the state going to do when they've finished harvesting all of the trees? When they cut all the forest down, what are they going to do? They were talking about hemp, about, um, you know, there's language about moving to a hemp economy. So I just thought that was interesting to <laughs> share that with you. <laughs> well, and I will add this tiny, a tiny plug, which is that uh, in April, um, we green, Greenhorns, which is the organization I run, we have 17 workshops this summer about mostly our natural resource economies. Um, and one of them is using hemp fiber to grow mycelium mushrooms to make an alternative to plastic for our kelp buoys. So instead of using plastic in aquaculture, being able to use materials that are biodegradable and of natural origin. So anyway, that's just a little plug for the, another plug for hemp. Wonderful. 
Well, I, I just want to say uh, thank, thanks again for everybody for coming. <clears throat> I'd like to thank uh, Winona once again, and also John, and also Severin. I want to thank you very, very much, uh, Severin, for uh, all the work that you're doing on this project. And also, um, you know, um, uh, for Jan also and Earthworks for being here and all the other people uh, that are involved in this project. And I certainly appreciate everybody that's, um, you know, got online today. And uh, please reach out, reach out to all your friends and and uh, contact your legislators and um, get involved. And, um, you know, uh, we've got a website there and uh, just contact us and we'll reach out to you. And, um, you know, we've got a lot of uh, work to do. And I appreciate all the efforts that people are uh, coming together. And because this is a problem that we all going to face, every one of us. I, it's, it doesn't matter what color we are, where we're from. It's it's all affecting each and every one of us. So collectively with one mind, I think we can uh, overcome some of these people that are trying to come in here and cash in on the resources and, and trying to exploit the resources and um, you know, make uh, you know, um, long-term effects you know, on the environment as well as the, the consumption of water. So uh, once again, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate each and every one of you for having me uh, as your moderator this evening. So on behalf of uh, the Toma family here, thank you very much. Thank Good you, night, thanks. everyone. See you thanks. next time. Stay tuned. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all.